you have likely never heard of Rudolf Verba, even by his given name, Walter Rosenberg. But a new book rightly aims to change that. It's called The Escape Artist, The Man Who Broke Out of Auschwitz to Warn the World. It's written by Jonathan Friedland, a journalist and weekly columnist for The Guardian, and he joins us now on the line from London, UK. Jonathan, it's a great pleasure to meet you. I, I read the book. It's an extraordinary book. It tells an incredible tale. And let's just set up our conversation with uh, a couple of pictures here, because, of course, there are too many people who don't know enough about this time period in history. This would be a shot of one of the many chaotic scenes of hundreds of people uh, soon to be killed at the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp complex. And one of the people who arrived at that place many, many years ago is this man, who changed his name ultimately to Rudolf Verba, just 17 years old when he arrived at Auschwitz in a cattle car, stuffed in there. They tattooed his arm with number 44070, and he spent nearly two years there. Now let's start with this. Give us a sense about the kind of death, mayhem, and violence that would have been a daily part of Walter's life back in the, the mid-1940s. Well, as you say, Steve, uh, death and destruction all around for the 17-year-old uh, Walter. We'll, we'll, we'll call him Rudy, I think, or Rudolf Verbo, because that was the name that would accompany most of his life. When he arrived, he saw straight away that this was a kind of sprawling metropolis of death. Uh, there were casual beatings handed out at the slightest provocation from the guards there, from the henchmen of the guards, SS men armed with automatic weapons, which they would fire off if anyone attempted to sort of even break out of line, uh, forced into slave labor, uh, back-breaking work where people would fall where they stood uh, under the conditions, often under the whip of one of those effectively slave drivers, people who would drop dead from disease or starvation. And that was even before uh, Rudy would understand that there was a larger process of industrialized killing going on. Uh, it took him a, a few, a matter of weeks for that penny to drop. Now, of course, we know a, a, a notoriously associate Auschwitz with the gas chambers. That was not known to anyone on the outside or even to new arrivals. It took time for that penny to drop to realize there was systematized murder going on in this place hour by hour every single day. The Nazis had, ironically enough, a place called Canada, which um, put a different picture on the place. And I'm gonna read an excerpt from your book just to explain to people what went on in quote unquote Canada. Canada, you write, was another country and another world, a land of plenty where stomachs were full, the wine was fine, and the menu forever packed with exotic delights. It was a place of sensual pleasures, of crisp sheets, silk stockings, and soft plush furs. There was wealth in every denomination, gold and silver, diamonds and pearls. It might have been the richest, most luxurious place in Europe, and it was in Auschwitz. And let's also bring a picture up of that. There's a snapshot of the place they called Canada. How did it get that name, Jonathan? Canada was a, an area, a uh, part of the camp. Um, it got that name because, as you said just there, reading that extract, this was a place where uh, luxury goods uh, of all, uh, of every possibility, of every kind, were piled up high. Um, and that was because these were the possessions uh, of those people who arrived at the camp. Uh, they brought with them bags uh, with their, uh, you know, with their worldly goods. But if they had anything of value, they brought it because they thought, who knows, this may be an insurance policy, this may be a bribe. Why called Canada? Because Canada, it turns out, in the central European imagination of the middle of the 20th century, was associated uh, with a kind of land where the streets were paved with gold, uh, a land uh, flowing with milk and honey, if you like. Lots of people from uh, you know, the Czechoslovakia or Hungary had moved to Canada in the 1930s or 20s and made their fortune there and written back to their families and said, you know, Canada is the is a place of unimaginable wealth. And so therefore it became a nickname for the part of the camp where all these possessions were stacked up. And uh, our character, Rudy, was there 
working again slave labor but his job was to sort out those big bundles and cases that you flashed up in that photograph that were uh, you know stripped from new arrivals in Auschwitz and they were piled up high in warehouses and sorted blankets pots pans clothes shoes famously children's shoes um, but also if there were objects that were found hidden in the lining of uh, the hem of a skirt or uh, you know underneath the the fly of a pair of trousers you know people might sew in a diamond or a wedding ring or even a bundle of dollar bills stashed inside a toothpaste tube the people the sorters fellow prisoners in Auschwitz uh, in Canada would find them it turns out Rudy had many different jobs while he was in Auschwitz and most of them far more dangerous and death-defying than the time he worked in Canada what was the significance ultimately of his having had so many different jobs in that place well, it meant that he was able, through being bounced around uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau as a slave in so many places and for so long, you mentioned at the top there that he was there for nearly two years, it meant that he had an extraordinary kind of panoramic view of Auschwitz-Birkenau and its operations. He more or less saw at first hand the entire system from the moment a train pulled in, a transport full of Jews brought in from all points of Europe, you know, France, Germany, Poland, Hung uh, eventually Hungary, but um, uh, you know, Belgium. Uh, he would see those trains come in, but he would see every stage of the process right up until uh, up up uh, uh, to the doors of the gas chamber itself. He never was one of those uh, Jewish prisoners who was forced to work in the gas chambers themselves. There were some so-called Zonderkommando who were forced to, you know, remove the bodies from the gas chambers. He was, didn't do that, but he saw everything else. And it meant that he was a kind of 360 degree witness of what happened in Auschwitz. He had an unusually wide knowledge of what happened in that camp even his starting point, I mean, he did a few jobs in the in, in what would become known as Buna, the industrial site where some of Germany's biggest known corporate names uh, were building a massive industrial plant. He worked there for a while building that backbreaking work, carrying bags of cement on his back, but was then moved later to Canada, where we described. And that was a really important place for, for in his journey, if you like, because at first, he didn't understand what all these piles of clothes, what they meant. Steadily, the penny dropped when he realized there are more clothes here. There are more objects here than there are people, fellow prisoners around. And he's realized, for example, that he could see men's clothes and women's clothes, but also children's clothes. And yet there were no children. And slowly, and he would later say with some embarrassment, it took him a while to to. to draw the ob what we now think of as the obvious conclusion, he realized that this was a place, unlike any that had existed in human history before, this was a place of industrialized murder. There were reason why there was more stuff in Canada than there were people, he realized, was that people were being brought to this place to be killed. Let's do another excerpt from the book. If the Nazi plot to destroy the Jews relied on keeping the intended victims entirely ignorant of their fate, to ensure they were lambs, not scattered deer, then the first step towards thwarting that murderous ambition was to inform the Jews of the capital sentence that the Nazis had passed on them. Somebody had to escape and sound the alarm, issuing the warning that Auschwitz meant death. Around the time he turned 18 years old in September 1942, as he watched the SS decide with a flick of a finger who would live and who would die, Rudolf concluded, that person should be him. So he decides that he wants to escape, a place that no Jew had ever escaped from. I appreciate the fact that you don't want to give all the details away here, uh, but can you give us a hint of how he did it? Yeah, I mean, I will. And just before that, I mean, that, in that extract, it's crucial to realize that the motive, what was prompting uh, Rudy was this realization that the people who were arriving with these bags and clothes were doing that because they had no idea of what fate awaited them. They thought they were arriving for new lives in the East. And that was what may enable this process to be smooth for the Nazis. The very fact that the victims were 
ignorant of their fate. That's why they would have be relatively compliant. And so, as that extract showed, Rudy came to the conclusion that the only way of slowing down this Nazi killing machine was to inform the victims. And so he decides it should be him. He he had uh, already had this impulse to be uh, you know, difficult as a prisoner. He tried to escape at different stages, even before he got to Auschwitz. But now he had this new motive, and he looked around and together with his escape partner, Fred Wetzler, who was from the same hometown in Slovakia, the two of them came up with this ingenious uh, thought, which was others, others had tried, other Jews had tried to escape uh, Auschwitz before. Um, they had done it by often trusting their fate to, you know, bribing an SS guard and so on. Those had not worked. They spotted a loophole in the Nazi defences. Now, this was not a physical gap. There was no hole in a fence somewhere that you could climb through. Rather, they saw that the Nazi protocol uh, that uh, was enforced was enforced without variation. And they came up with, and I'm going to hold back the exact method because I want people to read the story, but they realised there was this gap, in the, the this flaw in the Nazi method and the, they worked out a way that if they could somehow hide within the camp for three days and three nights, uh, evading detection, uh, which was no mean feat, there was a way, if they could just do that, there was a way to get out. Now, that was, you know, it sounds hard, but it was even harder than you could possibly imagine to be hidden inside for three days, three nights. When they knew they would be looked for, the Nazis did not want anyone escaping that camp, partly for the reason we just mentioned a moment ago, which is they didn't want word of Auschwitz to escape, to leak out with any escapee. They didn't want the world to know. And therefore, a couple of thousand SS men, together with their bloodhounds and sniffer dogs, were searching for anyone who might try and hide in the camp. And, you know, Rudy and his... Escape partner Fred Wetzler, the two of them were, were, had picked up all kinds of advice and tips from fellow prisoners, including, for example, that they, if you doused a particular kind of Soviet tobacco in gasoline, in petrol, and then dried it, those leaves, that dust of tobacco, gave off a scent that the uh, SS Nazi dogs found repellent and would they would not come near. That, that was the level of preparation that, you know, then just uh, 19 years old by this time, uh, Rudy and together with Fred, they went to huge lengths. They were meticulous in their preparation. And in April 1944, uh, incredibly, this, uh, this feat that, you know, all but no person had ever achieved before, a Jewish prisoner to engineer their own escape with the help only of their fellow prisoners uh, uh, to get out of Auschwitz and stay out and successfully make their way to freedom. Virtually unprecedented for a Jewish prisoner to do that. And, uh, uh, and yet Fred and Rudy together pulled that off. Now, as you tell us in the book, they very much wanted to get out because they wanted to get the word out about what was going on at Auschwitz and Birkenau and the systematic murder of Jews that was taking part there. And, and they managed to do that. They reached home in Slovakia. They dictate to somebody what turns out to be a 32-page bombshell report, forensic detail from memory of Auschwitz's killing machine, translated into a variety of languages. Uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's put this sketch up here. This is something that, by memory, uh, Rudy managed to describe uh, to the people doing the report. This is essentially the, uh, the outline, the, the layout of, of Auschwitz. And the report does, it does get out there. It ends up on American President Franklin Roosevelt's desk. How did he respond, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing to think of, this sort of teenage boy from Slovakia who already has pulled off this improbable feat, becoming one of the very first Jews ever to escape from Auschwitz. Uh, he and Fred get out the word out. As you say, the report is smuggled out hand to hand. Remember, you know, this was occupied Europe. It couldn't just be published. It had to be smuggled out and does, uh, you know, across borders secretly through a whole variety of very elaborate and improbable characters, which I chart in the book. It gets to, as you say, the desk of 
uh, Franklin Roosevelt, also Winston Churchill in London, uh, Pope Pius in Rome. And Fre uh, Rudy's assumption always had been the second word was out, then, of course, the world would act. How could they do anything else but uh, respond? And yet, um, and, uh, and by then, the report had been attached uh, to a plea from Jewish leaders around the world to... Uh, uh, do take action by bombing the railway tracks to Auschwitz. The thinking was, if Auschwitz is a factory of death, then take out the conveyor belt, namely those railway tracks that took transports of Jews by a spring of 1944 at a rate of 12 to 15,000 people every day. Take out those railway lines. And yet that didn't happen. Why not? Roosevelt in Washington, well, it was a combination of, I would say, of practical objections to do with how you bomb, when you bomb, day, night time, which Air Force had the capacity and so on. The Brits said, we don't, we only bomb at die by night. If this has to be done by day, ask the Americans. The Americans thought about it and Roosevelt said he was very uncomfortable. He, he thought if the United States is bombing railway tracks, then there will be some Jews killed and therefore uh, we will be implicated in this whole horrible business, he told one aide. So there was that. But there was also prejudice played a part. There was a degree of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish prejudice, which meant the report encountered uh, incredulity, which said, you know, in the words of one um, London official, we have to allow for a degree of Jewish exaggeration. Uh, was one response. There was an army publication in the United States that saw this report that had been smuggled out against all odds at great cost and said, mm, we think this is too Semitic an account. Uh, mm -hmm. And we would like something we, you know, which is less Jewish. Uh, we would like to hear about war crimes the way the victims are not Jews. Um, there was an official in London who said, I think we have done enough for these wailing Jews. So there was anti-Semitism. There was practical problems, but the number one problem, and this did not was not confined just to the Allied leaders, that the report encountered was straightforward incredulity. There were hu human beings, Jews among them, who simply could not believe the horror they were reading about. They went into a kind of, now we would say, a state of denial, where they thought this is just too awful to be true. Even if I believe it, I can't absorb it. I can't act on it because it's too much to to take in. And that was the response that was in, in, in several quarters. And yet I think it's the one response that Rudy p p with Fred as young escapees never bargained for. Well, Rudy did get the word out. He got the word out to the highest authorities. They didn't necessarily do much about it. Are you able to conclude then whether or not his original mission namely to save more Jews from ending up in Auschwitz, was accomplished. It wasn't accomplished to the extent he wanted, because he wanted desperately for the warning to get out before the Jews of Hungary were taken to Auschwitz. They were the last community left in Europe who had not been pulled into the Nazi inferno. And they wanted to save the Jews of Hungary, Fred and Rudy. They got the report out in time. It could have happened. And yet it was not passed to the Jews of Hungary themselves. And that really preoccupied Rudolf Verber for the rest of his life, because 437,000 Jews of Hungary were sent to their deaths. That said, the report was published. It made it into the Swiss press in late June of 1944. And a series of diplomatic moves followed that led ultimately to the regent, the de facto ruler of Hungary, uh, issuing an edict to halt the deportation of the Jews just in time to save the 200,000 Jews of Budapest, the capital, before they could be deported to Auschwitz, which is why I say that Rudolf Werber, together with Fred Wetzler, can be credited with saving an astonishing 200,000 Jewish lives, an achievement which I think means Rudolf Werber ranks alongside Anne Frank or Oscar Schindler or Primo Levi as that group of Jews whose stories define or should define our understanding of the Holocaust. To me, he is a towering figure of this period, a hero of this period, 
who has not had the recognition he deserves. Well, he's getting it now, thanks to you, and appropriately so. Let's, uh, Jonathan, fast forward the story a bit because there's a Canadian angle to this story. Uh, Rudy, of course, after the war is over, uh, he does marry, not a particularly happy marriage. He gets married and does have a couple of daughters. We've got a picture of him with his two kids here. There they are, Zuza and Helena. And he eventually becomes a professor at the University of British Columbia in Western Canada. And, and I guess I, I can say this here, I saw him when he, when he was an expert witness at the Zundel trials in Toronto. This would have been back in the uh, 1980s. How significant was he in the case of that propagandist and ultimately uh, hate monger, Ernst Zundel? He, he was hugely central. Um, uh, uh, and he was, Rudolf Herber was the star witness uh, for the prosecution, in effect, against this Holocaust denier, Ernst Zundel. Uh, he was on the stand for hour after hour after hour, partly because of what we talked about earlier, which is that he was this ultra witness. He was this man with a panoramic view of what had happened uh, in Auschwitz. And the prosecutors understood that, that he was somebody who could testify to every aspect of the Nazi killing machine. You know, most survivors, look, most Jews who were brought to Auschwitz had a life expectancy measured in hours. Even those who survived were often there only for a matter of weeks, a couple of months, maybe three months when they were liberated. To have somebody who had been there for two years and had worked in place after place after place made him an extraordinary witness. And he was a wonderful performer in the courtroom. He had a, you know, he, we haven't talked about how deeply charismatic a man Rudolf Verber was. But in these years, these last three decades of his life, he lived in Canada. He made a second marriage to. Uh, um, uh, his wife, Robin Verber, lived quite uh, a sort of uh, found a kind of degree of happiness that had eluded him before then. But he would often be called to testify in trials of Nazi war criminals uh, uh, as an expert and, and as both an expert and a witness. He was both at once. He'd been there, but he also had this deep knowledge uh, of it. And in the case of that Holocaust denier who was found guilty, uh, Rudolf Verber was really a central figure in making sure that justice was done in that case. And I think in, you know, in the Canada of the 1980s, there would have been people following that trial, which you covered, who would have known his name. But, but more largely, he you know, was allowed to slip into relative obscurity that not, you know, outside his specialist historian circles, people didn't really know his name. Well, he died almost uh, 20 years ago, I guess. And, and one way you describe him in the book why don't we finish up on this, is he was not a Holocaust survivor that, quote unquote, met expectations. In fact, when he talked about those days, he often had a, a, a curious smile on his face. Did you ever get to the bottom of why he, why he was not what you would expect for a Holocaust survivor? Yeah, I mean, he would unnerve interviewers. He did have this manner uh, which, you know, he would be smiling at the kind of bitter irony of it. There was a sardonic humor there he saw he had a very you know he, he saw the black humor in what he was describing and one interviewer famously claude landsman maker of the film Shoah, said to him why do you smile when you speak about these events and he said do you prefer i should cry it was mm. you know he he saw the kind of black human comedy in a way that what human beings are capable of and thought you either fold you know curl up and uh, and weep and die at that or you live on uh, but he was also powered by something which I think we're uncomfortable imagining in Holocaust survivors, even though it's in a way it's so obvious, which is anger. He was angry at the people, the Nazis who had done this to him and his fellow Jews, but also to those people who had failed to pass on his warning. He and Fred had done the hard part. They had managed to do what was all but impossible as Jews, which was to escape from the hardest place in Europe to escape from. They had smuggled out this report, crossing marshland and forests and rivers, evading Nazi bullets to get back to Slovakia. They had managed to type out this report of extraordinary feat of memory. Rudolf had a, a, a phenomenal memory. And yet there were people who did not pass on his warning, Jewish leaders in some cases in Hungary, and did not act on his warning. And we can think there of allied leaders. And that he could not forgive. You know, the title of his memoir that he wrote in 1963 was, I cannot forgive. And he could not forgive those people who had failed 
those 437,000 Jews he believed could have been saved if they had been warned in advance. And that made him an uncomfortable witness. He was not somebody who would give you, uh, who would talk in very sort of healing, consoling platitudes about, you know, man being ultimately good to his fellow man. He had a message of anger and fury. And that made him somebody people were wary of inviting onto public platforms. And that partly explains why he's not as well known as I think he should be. Well, Jonathan, if I may say, you've done exemplary work to bring his story to the public. The escape artist, the man who broke out of Auschwitz to warn the world, is a tremendous and important read. And we're glad that it's brought Jonathan Friedland, columnist for The Guardian, to TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.